Good afternoon and welcome to another week's security seminar. Uh, this week I will be giving the presentation. I'm Gene Spafford and the goal of this particular presentation is to present to you what I view are some of the top technological challenges in InfoSec. What are some of the uh, fertile areas for research that will advance the state and practice of InfoSec? The presentation has four general sections that I'm going to go through. Uh, rather heavy on the text. So the first is on the context of the current environment, particularly current networked environments, uh, where our security concerns are uh, manifest, where we have many machines connected together for e-commerce or government purposes. Then as I go along, I'll talk about what are some of the concerns in those environments, the technological challenges, and finish off with some general observations that I think make these challenges and managing the environments that uh, they're in much more interesting. First off, it's interesting to note the changes that we've had in computing and computation and communications over the last few years. Some of you may have seen there was an article yesterday in some of the news services that we're celebrating the 30th anniversary of the ARPANET. Only 30 years since uh, the first experiments in really wide-scale computation of tying machines together began. And in the years since then, since the uh, late 60s, we've seen incredible increases in the speed and capability of our network connections. As I've noted uh, on the uh, presentation, in 1974, the average commodity speed that we were able to obtain was about 1,000 bits per second. And that wasn't terribly fast. Ten years later, in 84, we were up to the megabits per second, where we were talking about the low end of some of the Ethernet-capable uh, connections for wide area and local area networks. In 94, we were regularly talking about gigabits per second as commodity networking capabilities. And within another year or so, people are talking terabits per second. Some of the experimentation going on now is for very, very high capacity network connections uh, from machine to machine. The capacity has roughly been doubling once each year. But there are constants that have stayed the same. One of those constants is a physical constant, the speed of light. And that certainly affects how much information or how long it takes for information to get from one place to another. So although we can increase the capacity, uh, there is a limit as to the, the delay from site to site. But another aspect of communications bandwidth is also a constant, and that is what we are capable of uh, uh, receiving and processing as human beings. The uh, capacity now of the computers to collect information, transmit it, and present it through the displays is faster than we as organic beings can take in and process. We have exceeded the human bit rate. And this has resulted in radical shifts in the way that we present information and use it in uh, computing networks. The basic infrastructure that we're using for most of our networks now is uh, still largely based on experimental protocols. Those uh, experimental protocols were developed largely by graduate students as research projects in laboratories. And as a result of uh, those experiments, they were able to tie together machines that were able to communicate. And after a while, they communicated most of the time with uh, only occasional failures. And as more machines got tied together, they had to use the same protocols to interoperate. And now there is a huge mass of computer systems that are all using these experimental protocols. And they're unlikely or difficult to change because there are literally millions of systems that would have to interoperate with each other. And changing the protocols arbitrarily is a very difficult thing to do. There is no central authority, no single vendor, no uh, one central location that is going to push a change to all of these sites. 
This is brought about because of the interconnection of smaller networks under different administrative controls, different policies, different laws, different technologies. Each of these smaller networks is run according to its own rules, and as long as those smaller networks are able to communicate using standard protocols, they're allowed to tie in and connect to other systems. And this has also been brought about because of the commodity software and hardware situation where these protocols are present. You can go out now and for a few thousand dollars buy a system with cards, with modems, uh, with other uh, connectivity software and hardware pieces, and through dial-up connect into this global network and be an equal peer to machines running on the other side of the globe. That's an incredible change, a very rapid change. Seven years ago, if you look at uh, the history of the network, there was no commercial activity on the net. There were, there were no Ebays or Amazon.coms. Uh, there were no ways to buy things on the network. In fact, the rules of use indicated that commercial use of the network was prohibited. That was only seven years ago. Ten years ago, there were fewer than 75,000 machines that were connected together in the global network that we now call the Internet. The workstation itself is only about uh, 15 years old. So a very, very short time span has resulted in these huge changes. So where are we now? Well, going from that 75,000 systems to in excess of 2 million on all seven continents. And although no one has done a census, there are probably well in excess of 250 million people around the world who have access to this global network. Access for email, for login, uh, for all kinds of different protocols. And those 250 million people are located in over 150 countries around the world, each with its own customs and laws and economy and reasons for use of the network. If we look back over the last 11 years, the population of people with access to this network has been doubling at less than every 10 months for those 11 years. It has been a constant process of doubling each time in less than a year. This has some interesting consequences I'll mention in a moment. As well, recent indications are that the volume of traffic being carried on the network is also doubling and approximately every 90 days. This is an incredible growth curve and it shows no signs of slowing down or stopping. I wanted to return to this point about the population change. If it's doubling every 8 to 12 months, then if you work out the figures, this says that over half of the people currently on the network have less than one year of experience with the network. That's a, a, a simple extrapolation from those numbers. Less than 5% of the users have five or more years of experience. And if you look at those few of us who've been active in the networking arena for any length of time, fewer than 1% have 10 years or more of experience. This has brought about a change in attitudes. It's brought about a change in culture. Because when the network was originally designed, when those experimental protocols I was talking about were being developed, the population that had access to the net were mostly technologists and scientists. They had at least an undergraduate education. Many of them had uh, graduate degrees. And they were very dedicated to the vision of how networking could change the future. It's not the case now. It's now the case that for a few hundred dollars, you can go out and get a web TV account and a box and be on the network. And all you have to do is be able to write an X on your check. And that's enough. So the people who now have access to the network, in fact, the majority of people who have access to the network and are using it, do not have the same level of education, of experience, of background, or necessarily a vision as to how the network should be used. So what are the concerns that these changes have brought about that leads us to be worried about security in the direction of uh, the network and of information technology. Well, part of it is that the uh, pace of change is increasing. Despite these incredible changes that I've just been mentioning, we are seeing an increase in the rate of change that's going on. We're seeing smaller, more portable systems. And this implies that there will be more systems connected at points that are going to be harder to define. 
I would suspect that of the people watching this right now, perhaps half, maybe more, have some form of PDA, a Palm Pilot or a Windows CE machine or some other kind of system that they're carrying around, in addition to a laptop or a portable computer. And maybe these are connected uh, via wireless uh, connections or uh, plugging into a DHCP port somewhere. So we have very mobile, very small computing. Wireless computing is coming on. We're seeing a merging with multimedia computing and communications, telephony over IP so that we're using our computers as telephones. We're seeing telephones being marketed that are built, have built-in PDAs. So you can actually buy cellular phones that have a Palm Pilot or a Windows CE uh, computer built directly into the phone, and it's usable that way. We see computers with DVD connected to them. Uh, they have high-speed network connections for real audio, real video, uh, hook, uh, hooking up uh, cameras to them. So we're seeing this convergence of uh, different kinds of media. We're seeing constant connections in places that you would not have dreamed of two years ago. People with ADSL connections, cable modems, other kinds of connections so that their machines are online 24 hours a day at home, at work, uh, at some people even in their cars have got connections. So we're seeing a, a really radical change in the way machines are hooked up and where they're hooked up. The communications are dropping in price. If you read in the papers and you see the changing nature of the cost per minute for long distance service and connectivity costs for telephone companies, the looming competition for telephony over cable systems and other forms of communication, we're eventually going to get to the point where it is almost free to hook up all the time for whatever bandwidth you want to have. That these companies are going to make their money from add-on services and features, not from the communications themselves. We're also seeing some radical new architectures with the way systems are being designed and examined. Uh, issues such as thin client machines and multiprocessor machines and experiments into even more radical architectures having to do with uh, light-based computing or quantum computing. We're also seeing issues of data warehousing where the data is no longer necessarily resident with the processor and the user interface. People who have home systems may actually be warehousing all of their private files at a third party where that data is properly secured and backed up and stored, and they access it from wherever they happen to be. And if this concept isn't immediately obvious to you, all you have to do is look at installing a new version of one of the web browsers, and it asks whether you want web-based mail. Uh, Hotmail is probably not a good choice at the moment. <laughs> but there are a number of these facilities that allow you to actually store your data physically separate from wherever your presence is on the network. And that is leading to a revolution in the way we use computing. Where we're headed is fairly clearly going to be a worldwide network where it doesn't matter where you're located because you will have access. And you'll have access to your data and to other machines over high-speed networks of some kind that are relatively cheap, that are not, not that expensive. Uh, it'll be ubiquitous no matter where you are. and despite some government attempts to the contrary, uh, I believe that strong encryption is going to be widely deployed. We are going to have a truly mobile computing environment within a matter of a few years. This is going to raise some interesting questions. Because how are we going to use these computers? If we talk about the information highway, and I, I said in, in 2001, it's probably more like 25 or 2010, but if you extrapolate the current growth curves simply into 2001, at the current rate of growth, every human on the planet will have internet access by the year 2001. That probably is not going to happen. But the growth curves extrapolate to that. Some of the studies that have been done, if you extrapolate them, show that at least in North America, by the year 2001, each one of us will have around 250 computers in our household. Some of those will be in our car. Some of those will be in our kitchen appliances. They'll be in our house controllers. They'll be in our home offices. But we will have all of these computers working together to make our lives better. 
addressing uh, our home climate, uh, monitoring energy usage and reducing it, saving our recipes, our phone numbers, controlling emissions on our automobiles, controlling the shutters on our camera, and a number of other kinds of, of uses that we already see, but there will be many new ones yet to come. And the trend there is to hook all of those computers together so that they all talk together. This has been discussed in some literature as ToasterNet, that your toaster will have a processor in it and it will be networked together with your other appliances. People are talking about automatic navigation on the highways, that your automobile, you will steer it onto a major thoroughfare and it will then proceed to uh, uh, navigate you to where you need to go and, and uh, keep the right distance from other cars, monitor your gasoline usage, and so on. We're talking about everyone having a universal phone number so that instead of having six or seven phone numbers now, one for your office, one for your fax, one for your home, one for your cell phone, you'll have one. And that the computers around you in your environment will sense which phone to direct your calls to. I know it would be a big advantage to me. I'd have a, some numbers uh, I wouldn't have to remember. And this convergence with phone numbers and with IDs and the universal aspect of the network, combined with the convergence of the media, will allow us all to receive our favorite news and radio and other broadcasts and entertainment wherever we happen to be, wherever we want to be, and it will be billed appropriately. I know here in Lafayette right now I've been hearing advertisements from one of the local radio stations that over the summer they set it up wherever you go, you can listen to their broadcasts on the web. The distance is changing because of the network. We can network all these places together. We can have a virtual presence almost anywhere. But this leads to some very interesting security problems because the current protections that we have are not going to keep up with these changes. And there isn't really a lot of research going on to look at uh, some new methods to replace what we're currently using or should be using in some cases. So for instance, a lot of the firewalls that are out there cannot keep up with all of the new protocols being developed and the push technology and uh, virtual private networks and encrypted connections that are going through. Plus the volume. The higher capacity of networks as we're talking about the future means that firewalls are going to have to become much more capable to deal with the load and also with the fault tolerance issues. They become very, very complex. Intrusion detection currently is limited by capacity to monitor protocols, configurations, and traffic. And new methods of attack are being invented faster than firewalls are being uh, updated. Computer viruses are overwhelming scanner technology. Currently, macro viruses are being reported for uh, Word, the Microsoft Word, process, uh, Word processing environment at a rate of about 15 new viruses per day. That's impossible for scanners to keep up with. And then the vulnerability scanners themselves are very difficult to keep up to date, and most of them to work well are too intrusive. To put them out on a network and scan for vulnerabilities uh, can result in loss of the systems themselves or in surrendering too much privilege to the group that runs the scans. So many organizations are now reluctant to use them. Things that we've been depending on for the last few years to keep even are therefore beginning to fade from view. So it leaves us with questions, how am I going to protect all of those systems in my household against 250 million network users? If all of my systems at home are connected together, how am I going to protect myself against the vandals, the anarchists, and the criminals who may wish to abuse them? If there's a couple people in Australia that decide they want to uh, turn up my hot water heater or turn it off because it's on the network, or uh, uh, maybe a disgruntled former student in Norway who decides to uh, burn my toast in the morning. <laughs> what am I going to do to protect my systems with all of these low-cost, widely distributed processors in an environment where the communications bandwidth is so fast and the computing is so cheap? Businesses are going to want a safe environment to operate in. How are they going to protect against th the issues of fraud and theft? And a lot of this also has to do with accuracy and quality of the information. Because we not only have to worry about malicious activity, we have to worry about failures and cascading failures that could be much worse than simply Y2K. 
How are we going to protect against organized distributed attacks that target machines across states, countries, continents? And how are we going to protect people's privacy in doing so? Because we want to have systems monitored and protected, but we really don't want to give up any more of our personal privacy than we already have for that kind of protection. Computer criminals are out there with a lot of different motivations. And this isn't a talk on computer crime. But to just briefly look at some of the reasons, we see some who are just joyriding, are just doing it for the fun of it, because they can. There are some who are involved in industrial espionage or national espionage issues. So they want to break into systems. There are disgruntled users. There are a number of people who have grievances against particular software vendors, hardware vendors, uh, companies, or organizations. There are terrorists and anarchists who have uh, motivations because of political, religious, or ethical reasons. They may want to break into systems either because of a religious motivation or because they simply don't like the fact that, for instance, uh, McDonald's um, uses beef in their products. And that's their protests going on organized right now in Europe over that. Uh, or because of um, an oil company or, or uh, a fur company or other companies that have actually been broken into and been defaced because of ideologic reasons in what they do. And there is the specter also of organized crime. With computers being used to store all kinds of data, it's a great uh, area to go for fraud, uh, embezzlement, extortion, and other issues of crime, including money laundering. And then there's the simplest reason of all. As we start putting more financial instruments on the network, that's where the money is. And as Willie Sutton was alleged to have said, that's why he robbed banks, because that's where the money was. Well, that's why we're going to see more computer crime, because that's where the money will be. Computer crime investigation is in its infancy and isn't going to help us a lot, because it requires a big investment in people, in products, uh, in, in technology that we don't have. In the United States alone, if you look at all of the various law enforcement agencies across the United States, uh, fewer than half have more than 12 people in them. They're small. They don't have a lot of resources. Therefore, they are not going to be in a position to respond to and investigate computer crimes. The other organizations have very minimal funding in this arena. And they have not, to date, been able to significantly track incidents, develop trends, develop defenses. There are only about three or four places in the world that I know of that are doing research into computer crime investigation, tools, and technology. This is a real problem for the long term because that is one of the standard methods of deterrent and protection is working with law enforcement. We have problems with international cooperation. The network does not observe international boundaries, but laws do, and law enforcement should. Therefore, criminals who uh, cross international boundaries to commit crimes slow down investigation, impede progress and sharing of data and information, especially with the patchwork of laws that are currently in place internationally. Good computer crime prevention and investigation requires reporting and follow through that very few companies and organizations are willing or able to execute. Uh, that m most of these uh, organizations are not well equipped to prosecute small crimes. In fact, the criminal justice system in general is designed to go after very large-scale obvious crimes, the egregious crimes, the ones that really are important to set an example. And smaller crimes are generally pursued as a matter of convenience or opportunity. Most of the computer crimes to date are small crimes. And as a result, it's very difficult for them to muster the resources necessary to follow through. And then there are a number of other issues that are not really related to crime or technology that we're going to have to solve, having to do with privacy, regulation of encryption, some of these transnational issues. Taxation is a big problem. When we're doing electronic commerce on the network, where are you in the sense of paying sales tax? Is it where you, the buyer, may be? Is it where the merchant is located as a physical entity? Or is it where some third party, such as a bank clearinghouse or ISP, may be located? 
That makes it very difficult for sales tax or value-added tax to be collected if we can't determine where the locality of the sale is actually, uh, actually is. Intellectual property issues. Who owns the information? Who owns web pages, images, media? The debate now about streaming video and audio and who owns it and how to protect it is going to have an impact on all of us for the consumer goods that we buy, whether they're MP3 players or video disc players. There are some interesting issues over what are called sunshine laws for government that require public records to be made public. Well, what is a public record? If I send email to someone else in the department because we are state employees, is that a public record? Does that mean it now has to be archived and preserved and available to anyone who wants to see a copy? How is that going to change the way I do business? If we do electronic voting or any other kinds of electronic communications in public, how is that going to affect what we do? And mandatory access laws. Some of the people who could most benefit from increased information technology are currently excluded from it because they can't afford the computing infrastructure, the network connections. They can't afford telephones in their homes right now. And many of them, because of the school systems uh, that they were supposed to have or were not able to attend, are not at a level of literacy to take advantage of the primarily text-based form of communication that we have on the network. We are increasing the gulf between the haves and the have-nots by the accelerating pace of information technology. What effect will that have on us, uh, on society in general, and on some of the legal and, and ethical issues that are posed? All of these are challenges that we are facing and that are going to become more acute as the rate of technology infiltration into our lives increases. With that as a backdrop, let me now focus in on what I see as some key technological challenges that we have facing our community that we need to address because they will make a difference. And all of them have as backdrop questions of how are we going to ensure confidentiality of information, the privacy of individuals using systems, how are we going to deal with issues of quality, integrity, fault tolerance, interconnection and standards. These are all issues that we have to keep as a backdrop to our other solutions. Because if we find ways of solving some of the social or technological issues, but we don't do things to preserve individual privacy, our solutions will not be accepted by the general public. If we come up with solutions that have systems that are yet more unreliable than we're currently using, again, people are not going to want to use them. So the challenge is to keep the qualities that we uh, wish to have present while solving the problems. That makes them even more complex. And these have to be suited for this rapidly changing environment with a large base of legacy systems. If someone in this room were to come up today with a solution to one of my 12 challenges that required installation on something other than an Intel platform, it's unlikely it would have a major effect because of the large base of legacy systems. Or at least it's unlikely it would have an immediate effect. It might have a long-term one. It's complicated by the fact we have few research professionals in the field. One-size solutions tend to be what gain in the marketplace but don't actually work to solve the problems themselves. Governments want to be a player in all of this, even though they are way behind the curve. Uh, both in the technology and in the understanding of the problems. And so when they step in, generally what happens is it's more in the uh, nature of interference or regulation. We're going to have an increasing nature of non-national threats, the organized crime, the terrorist threats, as well as the international issues. So let's look at these technological issues with these in mind as backdrop. I believe that the key problem that we have right now is we don't understand policy. We don't understand how systems are supposed to be used, what we want to allow and what we don't want to allow. We don't understand how to tell users exactly what is allowed and not allowed. And therefore, we don't know how to use policy to look for misuse and intrusion and other kinds of problems with the system. 
Not only do we not understand policy individually on individual machines, but we don't understand how to compose policy, to take existing systems and put them together in any kind of coherent way, temporarily or permanently. If we're going to do business on the network of the future, we have to be able to merge systems together in business partnerships or to connect systems together to execute trades or deals and then to be able to separate them again. How are we going to do that while preserving the overall security of our systems? How are we going to do that in a way that is acceptable to our stockholders and officers and regulatory bodies unless we have some form of policy mechanism that has some provable aspects to it, that has automated methods of detection and enforcement. How are we going to be able to audit against these policies unless we are able to express them clearly? I believe that this is a very fertile area for research. Could also be coupled with how to take natural language and express it in policies, or take policies and express them in natural language. It would be nice to have a path that would go from human expressible me uh, mechanism down into code actually running on the machine that can be used to determine and enforce the policies. And to use those to build up policy libraries for standard policies or interconnection so that we can pick and choose as we bring new systems online. That's my first challenge. Second challenge has to do with reliable metrics. If I'm going to have security on my system, if I'm going to support privacy, if I'm going to support access, how do I know if I've succeed, succeeded with this? Well, I have to have some way of measuring how secure my system is. I have to be able to measure how secure my network is. I have to be able to make changes in the system and then reliably compare using some objective mechanism between the two different instances and determine if I've made a valuable change. We don't have that currently. We don't have any kind of reliable metrics that we can use to measure security, to determine if we have done the right thing, to determine if some new exposure or threat is significant and how significant, or to be able to make any informed choice between uh, expenditures for protection. That's an area where a lot of research can be done, not simply in computing, but also in issues of economics, to look at questions of cost-benefit analysis and return on investment, to actually look at the problem of, gee, where should I spend my money to protect my system? Third area of research is affordable high assurance. I would like to know that a system out of the box by a vendor I may not have used before is going to work properly, is going to have good security built in. How do I do that? What mechanisms, what coding uh, conventions, what standards, what approaches can be used, and perhaps also what social and legal pressures can be brought to bear, so that I can be relatively certain that when I install this new system, it will behave as documented, and it will behave according to some standard set of behaviors that are appropriate for my environment. Furthermore, these technologies and techniques and, and uh, uh, methods and standards need to be applicable to small vendors as well as large because there is a great variety of systems produced by small vendors that we don't want to throw away and we don't want to change the environment so that the only systems that we want to buy are from very large vendors because many of them have had a very poor record of providing high assurance systems some of the smaller vendors may actually have better solutions for us. How are we going to have repeatable security? Again, metrics play a role here, but they're not the only part. This is an area that has a lot to do with software engineering and may actually have something to do with civil and uh, criminal liability law. The insurance industry has done a lot to help us develop product safety in automobiles and fire safety and some other issues because they want to reduce their rates and so they have found ways to get people to accept and buy higher uh, security, higher assurance systems whether they're automobiles with seat belts and airbags or whether they are putting in sprinkler systems and fire extinguishers in buildings. The economic incentives involved there and the uh, lawsuits for companies that don't pay attention are pressures that have changed 
a great deal of our technology in those realms and may have the same effect in computing if brought to bear. Assured availability. The whole area of uh, availability and quality of service is an area that needs a great deal of research. We have no formal models yet that are really well applied in this arena. We want systems that are available when we need them with the capacity that we need when we need them. They should have resistance to attack, resistance to failure, and if there is a successful f attack or failure, they should reconfigure and gracefully degrade so as still providing us with necessary core services and features. This is an area that has undergone some study recently, but to date, no real results of merit have come through yet. A great deal of research is yet to be done in this arena. Accurate risk data, really understanding the threat model. And this is not something that's going to be solved with a computer. This is going to take other methodologies to, to solve. Data collection, interviewing, psychology, organizational behavior, understanding where risks really come from, how big they are, how likely they are, how likely they are to succeed, and what the consequences of failures are. And this needs to be coupled back to those formal mechanisms of policy that I was talking about to perhaps provide an automated method of altering policy and altering defenses based on a changing threat picture. How are we going to collect and organize and classify these problems? Even understanding what the threats and vulnerabilities are in a scientific manner to be able to head them off to provide protections is an open area of research that very little has been done. Graceful penetration tolerance, so that if you're attacked, you can contain the attack. You can reconfigure, possibly redirect the attack initiate some kind of fallback and deploy recovery and investigation mechanisms necessary to find out where it came from, what it was, why it succeeded if it did, how to prevent it in the future and determine who to go after to make sure that they don't perpetrate the attack in the future. Many things tied in here having to do with not only the uh, toleration and reliability aspects but also having to do with forensics and investigation, criminology, and some other issues. All of the tools necessary to make this happen do not exist. We need to create them. And that ties into automated responses. Responding to attacks, but don't respond in error. If we build a system that attacks back, that may be part of a military system or a high security uh, commercial system, we don't want to do that in error. Does that even make sense? I don't know. That's an interesting question of, uh, of ethics and law. To have a system without human intervention do an attack back uh, if a system is uh, attacked. <clears throat> and how do we restrain those attacks or those responses so they do only enough to contain or stop or investigate something that's going on? How do we integrate many different systems together so that they can cooperate? if there is a wide-scale regional attack or countrywide attack so that they can work together to respond appropriately, to identify, contain, and respond. And doing all of this, how can we do it in such a way that the data that we collect and the methods that we use are still acceptable in the standard juris, uh, jurisprudence sense of acceptable evidence and chain of custody and other issues involved necessary to prove intent, to prove uh, location, to prove uh, who is involved so that we can successfully prosecute people who attack systems. None of these questions are currently being addressed that I know of uh, within the research community. <coughs> Forensics has broader application than simply computer security, communication security, IT security in general, it has applications in management of computer systems and network systems. Understanding what is coming across the network. Where is it coming from? What is it doing? What is that software that we just bought? What does it do? Again, from the news over the last day or so, 
some people have found some rather interesting variables and uh, crypto keys buried in Microsoft Windows that some people are speculating were placed there for nefarious purposes. Uh, how do we know? We know the code is present, but what does it do? Who put it there? Why is it there? To do any kind of reverse engineering on that code is in violation of not only the license, but currently is in violation of uh, laws in the U.S. at least. Is that appropriate for those laws to be in place? What tools do we need to re really investigate what it's doing? If a virus, computer virus gets on our system, where did it come from? What is it doing? How do we keep it out? How do we analyze it? Being able to look at a system failure after it happened and determine what caused it, what went wrong, and what needs to be fixed to prevent it from happening again it's currently pretty much a, uh, an intuitive folk art. People who are good at it have done it simply out of experience and don't necessarily have a standard set of algorithms and tools that are used so that others can replicate that experience and that knowledge. Here's an area where we need more research. Areas of identification and authorization. Out on the network, with hundreds of millions of people scattered all around the globe, each with hundreds of computers, how can we verify where a connection is coming from? How do we know who's really at the other end of that connection? And once we know who that is, in any, in any sense, how do we know that they're authorized to make that connection? It's possible to perfectly identify who you are, but still be the unknown to the people at the other end. I think any one of you, if you were to, uh, to walk into, uh, say, a grocery store in uh, Bozeman, Montana, and, and say, my name is, and then state your name and pull out your driver's license to show it, people are going to go, so what? Who are you? Or should you be here? Uh, what's your role? So we need more than simply good identification, which too many people focus on. There's also the que question of roles and authorizations and how those fit into the picture. How do we tie those together? In some cases, it may not be necessary to have your identity. We don't need to know who you are. We only need to know if you're authorized. Uh, certainly here in the university environment, many of the students, um, after you have uh, turned 21, and it's legal, of course, uh, may go to a local bar you show your ID at the door to, to get authorized, and they put a stamp on your hand for the rest of the evening. After that, they don't really care who you are. You have gotten a token for authentication to indicate that, that you have been authenticated. You are now authorized to go in and uh, uh, to be present on, on, at the bar. We have analogies to this online places where we don't need to know who you are, we just need to know, has somebody appropriate authenticated you? Do you have authorization to participate in the transaction involved? A lot of this depends right now on public key infrastructure, public key encryption, and that's technology that is not well developed either because there are issues there of availability of the keys and of the necessary central authorities. The interrelationships of different kinds of PKIs together to make them work Dynamic keys that change over time, that change with your role or that change with outside circumstances. In particular, dealing with revocation management. Most of the PKI structures now assume that keys are seldom revoked. That's a problem because in real life, key revocation may be quite frequent. And this places great load on the servers that have to handle the revocation requests. We don't know how to do that. This is an area of research. Audit trails. A lot of what we do in all of this, in the forensics and the analysis and the monitoring, in the intrusion detection and a lot of other uh, applications require useful audit trails. We need to understand what needs to be logged at each host, at each application, and throughout the network. But how are we going to store that in a reliable fashion? How are we going to manage the volumes of information? With the network capacities we're talking about, we can't save everything. So what do we need to save? And how best to save it? How are we going to change the auditing dynamically based on changing threat pictures and health situations? As the systems come under more load, 
you might want to actually do more monitoring to determine why the load is increasing. And yet in doing so, you increase the load on the systems that you're trying to monitor. These are interesting questions that have not yet been resolved. Security models. For over a dozen years, we've been focusing on this multi-level security model uh, for systems. The orange book being the first, the common criteria being uh, another model that's come along. That model for multi-level systems does not really work well in general access networks. It doesn't work very well in object-based systems. It doesn't work for thin clients. It doesn't work for active content. It also tends to be very expensive and add a great deal of overhead to systems. Users don't like it, and customers generally won't pay for it unless forced to. What are we going to replace the model with? Who is looking at the question of how do we conceptualize a system with different levels of access and security so that we can properly build to it? What are the alternatives and how do we adapt it to future computing architectures and networking architectures? Again, to my knowledge, no one is looking at this question. Multimedia security. We may know how to secure some small amounts of bits, but when we're dealing with real-time floods of information that we can't interrupt or we don't want to slow down at a firewall or with a monitor because it will cause uh, jerky video uh, 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 viewing or it will interfere with the sound quality of something transmitted or it will possibly uh, introduce an unfortunate lag in IP telephony. How are we going to build security measures to deal with these other kinds of data that have different kinds of processing rates and storage requirements? How are we going to provide security on databases and data structures that hold these kinds of multimedia that may merge them together for analysis? How are we going to uh, worry about classification issues or access issues when we merge satellite pictures from different locations and different times, or video cameras, or sound that we've picked up from different places? There are a whole set of questions here, and questions that we probably haven't even thought of yet because we don't have enough working systems, but shortly will. Here's another area that has very fertile ground for research that very few people are doing research. I think those are the top 12 areas from my perspective that are going to be necessary in the very near term that are not currently being addressed by enough researchers. There are other top technological challenges that I think are important, but we do have research groups looking at them. So they haven't been completely ignored. I don't think these 12 have gotten appropriate attention uh, to even begin to start thinking about solutions. Maybe some of you in the audience will be inspired to look at one of these issues. Now in the time that's remaining, I want to make a few other random observations that are associated with this, this whole arena of developing security and technology challenges that I think are important if we think about the context, if we think about the solution space if we think about the potential adoption of solutions. This is perhaps redundant considering uh, some of the things I've said previously, but it's a very rapidly changing environment. We don't have enough resources. We don't have enough people. The market is not currently going to be receptive to significant change. The users using computing systems generally don't even accept basic principles. We know that reusable passwords are terrible, but it's very difficult to get users to do anything different. There are a number of other issues that we know. Downloading software, emailing attachments that will run macros are terrible ideas, and yet it's next to impossible to break users of those habits. So we have this as an underlying theme that with this rapidly changing environment with little resor with, with, with uh, insufficient resources and with insufficient cooperation, we still have to come up with solutions to the challenges. 
I think it's entirely possible that political and social issues may dominate the technical ones. A very good example of this is encryption. We have known for a very long time how to use encryption to protect network traffic and to uh, have public-private keys for digital signatures and identification, authentication, to cryptographically sign programs to prevent them from being run after they've been infected with viruses, to distribute software with high assurance, and a number of other issues. And yet, it's the political challenges that keep encryption from being widely deployed. It has to do with issues completely out of the realm of the technological. An aspect of this has to do with the network being global, not regional. Coming up with solutions that work in one particular nation state, one language, one set of images, is not necessarily going to work globally. We develop locally, but we have to think globally. And globally now really means globally because we have those users in 150 countries around the world. In this country, it may be free speech. In another country, it's sedition against the government. And in a third country, it's blasphemy against uh, the current incarnation of, of uh, the Almighty. We have to deal with that in our solutions. If we don't, we will not get widespread acceptance. We will not get interoperable solutions. How do we even determine appropriate use in an environment like that? Questions of who really owns intellectual property, for instance, or what is appropriate to say on the network are very interesting questions. Who should be allowed to do business? Whose laws govern? Whose contract laws, whose credit laws, whose obscenity laws, whose free speech laws? How do we determine a standard that everyone can abide by? What is going to be the standard language? Right now, at least on the network, the majority of sites that are out there are in English. Yet, if you look at the potential global population, it should be Chinese. <laughs> Unless, of course, you speak French, in which case you believe it should be French. <laughs> it's an interesting question. How do we come up with a standard that everyone can agree to? Or if we don't agree on a single language or a single set of standards, how do we come up with interoperable versions that allow us to work with each other, to deal with each other, and communicate effectively? That's not a technological challenge. That's a different kind of challenge. Taxation is going to be a huge problem. Because if e-commerce is going to succeed, someone's going to want to take a slice of it. They're going to want to have the taxation for the goods and services, for monitoring the infrastructure, providing the law enforcement, and the other issues. But as I said before, who collects it? Where is the locality of some transaction that occurs totally in what's known as cyberspace? How are we going to enforce that and audit that and collect it? And of course, as I raised earlier, who's going to pay for the infrastructure for the poorer users within countries and poor countries that simply don't have the infrastructure in place? We have a basic problem with people using the network now. It's a question of responsibility versus authority or responsibility versus capability. We have a lot of people who believe that simply because it can be done, it's all right to do it. It's OK to put up a website that has offensive images or words. So it's OK to do. It's OK to break into somebody's website because they put poor security in place or because they were using a particular vendor's operating system. That doesn't make it right. We have to come to grips with this concept, particularly in a larger global arena, or we're going to have further problems. Computer viruses, spamming is a huge problem. Uh, the, what some people view as opportunities on the network, others view as abuses. We have to come to some general consensus as to how networks, how computers, and how information technology are going to be used, or we're going to have people staying away and not using it or we're going to have more cases of governments passing regulations that they little understand and that have unfortunate um, impacts on uses that we want to see and encourage. The marketplace is driving a lot of this. 
and we're going to have a lot of difficulty bucking the marketplace, so we need to find a way to work with it. One of my favorite quotes having to do with this is something that Andrew Young, former mayor of Atlanta and uh, UN ambassador, once said, is that nothing is illegal if a hundred businessmen do it. And we're seeing that on the networks. We're seeing that in general. Merchant interests will push us in directions that we may not want to go as technologists, as scientists, as scholars. There is an operating system that is largely dominant on the network now, which has poor assurance, poor security, uh, high number of user complaints, and yet because of the cost, even though people know it is the least desirable operating system in many ways for their environment, because it is cheaper, because it will run on the equipment they already have, they will buy it. We will have to continue to face that as a challenge in whatever solutions we come up with. The economics drive a great deal of what we do. On the other hand, we also have to think in terms of custodians of the public good. As professionals, we should be concerned that giving the public what they want is not necessarily the best thing. We may have a moral obligation to try to strive to a higher standard. And if so, how do we make that happen? And what is that standard? I think that's an interesting question. Uh, it's entirely possible that lawyers and insurance companies will take away some of our ability as a community of informed professionals to set some of these solutions if we aren't careful. Because that's where the money is. The lawyers and the insurance companies and the banking community, that's where the money is. And they, they can really move the market if they so choose. We don't understand trust. Everything's based on trust. We don't understand it. We have to understand it. Because a lot of what we're doing now is based on trust, and it may be misplaced. How do we create a web page that people are going to trust? They come to it and they do business. How do we know? The ability to cash electronic payment or to issue a credit card number should not instill in us trust. Being the government shouldn't instill trust because we're not talking about any single government. We're talking about a lot of them with conflicting goals and, and purposes and uh, people within those governments who don't even agree as to what the government roles and purposes should be. Vendors are not necessarily to be trusted. Simply because you buy software from them and it comes in a shrimp, shrink wrap package doesn't mean you should trust it, especially if you ever read the fine print on the licenses. Because they explicitly state that they're not responsible for much of anything if it goes wrong. That shouldn't make you feel good about it. And in the long term, how are we going to develop trust in someone we've never met? They're simply bits on the wire. We don't even know if whoever's at the other end is a real person. It could be a construct, an AI program. Certainly judging by some of the email I've gotten, there may be some of them out there. <laughs> and the technology is getting better. How do we know? And does it matter? If we are dealing with an artificial construct, does it matter for purposes of doing business? Can we still have a level of trust appropriate to the environment? I've mentioned before about privacy. Privacy will turn people away. People are concerned about privacy. We need to ensure it. We need to find ways of protecting it without giving up some of these other characteristics. We want to protect data. We want to protect data about people. We want to protect information about the information they access, that is, their access trail. People want to be treated as an individual rather than as a collection of data. How do we do that and build that into all of our systems and policies and understanding? I think we can do it by using economics. We can make privacy a selling point if someone wants to approach it that way. But we have to understand it well enough to start building it in. Of course, we don't understand all of the threat yet either. We don't know where the biggest threat is or what its nature is. There are many people who believe that information warfare, nation state hacking, is the biggest problem. I think that's nonsensical. The, the international economies are too tightly tied together for that to make sense. I actually think that we have more of a threat coming from uh, ideological terrorists and organized crime than we do from any nation state issue. And part of that also is that decentralized systems aren't as vulnerable as many people think they are. They're interconnected. 
and we're going to find that out January 1st in some unexpected ways, but I don't think we're going to have the widespread cascading failures that many people are talking about. Quality shouldn't be lost in all of this. Security is, in some senses, an aspect of quality. It's still the case that more is lost to bugs, disasters, mistakes, and user error than any crime, than any criminal activity. Systems that don't work right, systems that fail unexpectedly, systems that have confusing user interfaces cause us more problems in the long term. What are we doing to make them better? What are we doing to design programming languages that it's less likely to make mistakes in? Or user interfaces that more people can use reliably? Making computers cheap and simple to use does not necessarily mean that we're doing the right thing. Again, when does quality become a selling point rather than a liability? If you spend more time testing your code so it's slower to come to market and cost more, you shouldn't be penalized in the marketplace for that. And yet, that's the current situation. How do we change that before the lawyers and the insurance companies take the initiative away from us? In some senses, this is uh, preaching to the choir about not enough professionals. It's an overlooked infrastructure. We're trying to build this huge technological infrastructure without enough personnel trained to understand it and use it. And unfortunately, we don't have enough support for building the infrastructure. The organizations and the entities that should be supporting education, that should be uh, encouraging people to go into these high-tech, high-tech uh, information technology careers simply aren't doing it. At a time when, in the United States alone, projections are that we're having 300,000 unfilled positions per year, we're seeing the number of women and minorities enrolled in information technology courses decreasing every year for yet another year running. Why is that? There's something wrong with the overall picture where we're not encouraging the right kind of, of education and development of the, of the infrastructure, and where we aren't encouraging all of those individuals who have the capability to excel to go out and do that. One thing that, uh, again, right out of the news, something that, that many of you can uh, go out and find, is uh, what's currently going on in uh, Congress right now in the United States. The House Appropriations Committee has basically put through a budget, uh, an, appropriation, uh, an authorizations bill that's going to the Senate that embodies huge cuts in basic science research. We are running an unprecedented surplus in the federal budget, and yet they want to cut basic research in information technology of all places. But that's not the only place. NSF's budget is getting a cut. NASA is taking a $1 billion cut in their uh, appropriations. And almost all of the research budget in the Department of Energy's authorization bill was cut completely from the budget. It's, a, it's astonishing. But it's an example of the lack of understanding and endemic support to information technology, to understanding, <clears throat> understanding and using computing that we have going on throughout society right now. And with that, I've taken up an hour of your time. I'm open for questions from anybody here in the audience, and I don't know whether or not anybody at one of the remote sites can uh, ask questions as well. But I'd certainly be happy to answer any that come, come through. Yes? Yes, the body in front of Congress about computer security. Do you have any idea what part of the federal budget goes towards computer security research and applications? Very small amount goes towards computer security research and applications. The way that the, the federal budget is actually calculated, you'll find that most dollars are actually committed to three or four different things at once. So it's difficult to get an accurate count. It's audited. Yes. I think we'll uh, come up the intrusion detection network that the government is trying to get with other, with other uh, corporations within the industry. All right, the question is, what do I think is going to happen with the uh, intrusion detection efforts that the government is leading to try to coordinate uh, uh, government and industry together? The proposal that they had for IDNet that uh, caused such controversy. Uh, I don't think that they're going to have a lot of success with this. 
they may be able to create regional networks or regional groups that work together. But because of privacy issues, because of proprietary uh, issues, because of the difficulties I was talking about, emerging systems and having known policies to govern the way that they connect, it seems unlikely to me that we are going to see any kind of wide-scale connection for intrusion detection purposes. <laughs> Unfortunate, but... Do you think it's going to start to maybe spur ideas and growth and maybe trying to move the industry forward? Do I think that's going to spur the industry to grow and to move forward? Uh, it'll have to. I don't know how much of that will be the direct cause of it. There's a great deal of, of interest in intrusion detection right now. Tremendous amount of funding that's coming out of uh, uh, DARPA, that's coming out of many companies. The underlying problem is that a lot of people aren't thinking about the problem itself. The reason that they have to get sophisticated intrusion detection systems is because they continue to use garbage systems that allow anybody to, get, to waltz in through hundreds of known and unknown bugs. If we spent more time building reliable systems, we probably wouldn't need as much intrusion detection or even firewall technology. Unfortunately, again, we have this installed base, we have this user population, it'll be hard to change, and so now the attention is being uh, paid to layering something on top afterwards to try and remedy the situation. I don't see that as being a, a long-term solution to the problem. There's another question towards the back, yes? Well, two questions at two. best related. Uh, you know, the first one is I know that you know, Amer American military systems are you know, are built by American companies so that, you know, should uh, international travel break out, there is no problem getting those systems when we need another missile or whatever. Yet I do know that, you know, uh, you know most of the research into encryption is, is going on, you know, outside of the United States due to various laws. Uh, you know, and I know that the Justice Department is relying on BSD and other things that have come out of you know, other things in order to provide their reliable systems for putting their important stuff around. Uh, will there be a point where you know this become you know we're, we treated at you know until recently as munition where where encryption will be treated as munition in the established way as I mentioned. The other question is. You know, uh, we know some of our more secure systems are open systems. OpenBSD has this thing, and so uh, it's an open source product. Uh, yet, you know, when talking about open secure, you know, secure systems and stuff like that, more and more the insurance people you know, want you know software engineers to be you know engineers accredited and stuff. So, you know, is there a inherent contradiction between open source and? and what's going on with that. Like I said, tangentially related at best. Well, two, two interesting questions that could take, e each could perhaps take an entire lecture or more on their own, but I will, I will attempt to summarize at least my views on these. Uh, the first was uh, basically the question of how long uh, is the U.S. government and some other governments, but particularly the U.S. government, likely to continue its stance on treating encryption as a munition mm -hmm. and a restricted export, uh, especially with its increased criticality in federal systems and the fact that we're driving research in places outside the U.S. Is that an accurate summary of the question? Yes. Okay. Uh, we, are, we have been seeing a steady relaxation of the rules and the regulations and talking privately with some of the policymakers in Washington, most of them believe that they are eventually going to lose this battle, that eventually they're going to have to drop the restrictions. Their goal is really to slow down the acceptance of encryption until other methods are developed uh, to try to keep the advantage as long as possible. So it's going to be a slow process of doing this transition. I don't see any sudden changes, but it's possible. A lot of this is being driven through the executive branch of the U.S. government, so a change of who is in that office may uh, result in a change in the overall policy. This is one that perhaps consulting tea leaves and a crystal ball might give you better results. The second question was, to some extent, the relationship between uh, open source software and uh, assured security. And that also is a very complex issue having to do with uh, 
the kinds of software you, we're using and who contributes to them and how they're developed. I don't necessarily believe that open source software is automatically more reliable or more secure than proprietary software. It has the potential for many people to work on the problems involved and to enhance it and to find bugs. But we have seen many examples where software that has been out in the public domain for a very long time, people have seen the source code and worked on it for years, have failed to recognize horrendous security problems through them. The, the Kerberos weak, uh, weak key problem is a, is a prime example of that, where Kerberos was out for five or six years. Everybody had the code, looked at it, and had failed to recognize that the key uh, structure for Kerberos 4 was, was weak and could be broken in a matter of seconds. We've seen regular ongoing reports about buffer overflows in, in Linux and BSD derivatives where the source code has been out in the public domain. So those are not necessarily guarantees. It not only has to be open, but people have to understand the technology and be willing to look at it and work at it on a regular basis. You can achieve the same thing with proprietary software, hiring the best engineers, giving them the best tools, going about an organized method of developing the software, and if you do that and document that and deliver products that uh, consistently come to a high level of quality, I think it will succeed in the marketplace. The public will accept that. Because what you're really looking for are the end results, not necessarily the underlying philosophy where the code came from. I hope those adequately addressed what you asked. No. Close enough. Anybody else? Yes. What changes do you see in security techniques um, because of the development of, of small and portable systems? Are techniques like uh, perimeter security going to become worthless when people can walk in with a cell phone or a PDA that uh, is insecure? What kind of changes with highly portable systems? Yes, the, the whole definition of what's a perimeter, what's inside and what's outside is going to have to change. That many of those systems that we carry around may actually be inside a number of larger systems at any one time and we're going to have to worry about information flows between those systems. So you may actually have a portable wireless system that is using GTE for telephony, is using a local ISP for your personal web page, but while you're here at Purdue you're also getting uh, mail on your Purdue account. Now those are connected, those networks. How do we know, as the people managing those networks, that we don't have viruses coming through those connections? And how do you, as a user, know uh, who is gaining access to your system accordingly? So that whole question of perimeters and firewalls and monitoring traffic for the network is going to change in a very radical way. There was another question. Yes. Um, what kind of an impact do you think the recent file security and privacy breaches uh, will have on the public's opinion towards privacy and security? Uh, the question is, uh, what do some of the high-profile incidents that have recently occurred, what, what likely effect will that have on public perception? It seems unlikely to me that any single one of those is going to have a major change in public perception, but we have seen over time, at least the polls that I have seen that have been done of the general population, an increasing uh, level of concern with privacy of their individual data and uh, concern over their ability to influence how that data is used and what they're able to do with their computing environment. So as these continue, we have more and more people being distrustful of the system and of the organizations that maintain the systems. That may make it much harder for us to come up with solutions because they will be less accepting of them. I don't think any single one of those is going to have a, a catastrophic effect, though. Perhaps, again, Y2K or something like it could have a very major change in public perception. But could it be uh, something back um, uh, similar to what happened with the Luddites who revolted against the mechanized looms and, and uh, rioted and burned down factories and uh, killed people who, who operated them? Well, as someone who uses a computer, I hope not. But um, there, there is always that possibility that, that uh, if enough people get upset about something that happens, 
there could be an extreme negative reaction. We're seeing some of that with, with the way laws are being passed about uh, regulating access to uh, pictures and data and, and things online where extreme positions are being taken in response to some extent as a matter of frustration. That may continue as well. Other questions? Well, I guess that does it. Thank you very much, and we'll see you here next week.